I am not going to be giving any more projections of units for April 2nd or in the future, at least as far as I can see today, or, or for earnings later in April. In fact, this is because of people like AJ and Troy. Um, they're doing such a great job. Uh, I'm just going to let them do the job and I'll report on what they do. I'll still be giving future forecasts for months or years out based on a broad analysis of my expectations, but not like these guys where they're taking and looking at every single detail, doing a lot of on the ground research that I can't possibly do, don't have the staff for that. So I'm glad AJ and Troy worked their rear ends, rear ends off to get this data. And then they do this intense line by line analysis of upcoming numbers. Great job guys. And I just finished reviewing AJ's numbers today where he gives his projections of both the unit numbers as well as the earnings coming up and uh, did a fine job. And now I read his notes. And as I've said repeatedly, even if you were in the accounting department at Tesla, you cannot predict accurately what's going to happen next, to, next Tuesday or later in April when they do earnings, because there are so many moving targets. Now, as the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more data becomes available, it does get easier to get closer to a real number. But believe me, predicting the number for three months out or for six months out or for two years out, forget about it. There's so many things that could happen, like, I don't know, FSD, robots, I go, you go down the list. Anyway, Let's go ahead and we're going to take a quick look at what AJ has done. So first of all, he says earnings analysis. So this starts with 18.4% um, auto gross margins. Now, this is, of course, critical to the whole story. And he believes that the auto gross margins are going to get slightly better uh, because that's what happens when you are, you know, making more cars in the same plant. You know, all the kinds of things we talked about a million times before. He does see a couple of headwinds also, but he also knows that there's a number of things happening in battery costs and raw material costs, et cetera, that are going to drive some of those margins better. He does see a slight decrease in the average cost of the, of the car, and he gives some examples of where he sees price reductions that have taken place earlier in the in the quarter. Anyway, so he's at 18.4 overall gross margins. That's all sources, least everything, all right? And that's based, and that's also 417,000 unit sales. Now, you may be thinking it's going to be 450 or 475. No, I'm pretty sure that we can count that out. Could still come in at 425 or 430. I think there's a lot of unknowns there, but he's at 417 and Troy Testlike is also well under 420 at this point. So the number that he's expecting also will include 391 million in regulatory credits, which is a bit down from last quarter and also from same uh, quarter last year. No particular reason. I don't think he, he doesn't give, I don't think any particular reason why it might be down or up. See, that's one of those, I count that as a guess. He assumes only 275 cyber trucks for the month, but I got to tell you, even if it's 3,275, it's not going to be a material contributor to the numbers here, you know, by more than a penny or two. All right. He has got um, overall, uh, wait a minute, I'm trying to read this here, uh, 1.82 billion in revenues. Oh, here we go. 1.82 billion in revenues from energy production and storage, which is up nicely from last quarter and very nicely from a year ago, with a 24.4 gross margin on the overall energy division. This is about 380 million in revenue increase from this category. So that's a big benefit to the bottom line here. Services and and uh, services and other, which is the category, a slight downtick. No meaningful gross profit in that category as of yet, according, again, to AJ. This gives them overall a 7.7% operating profit. Every company in the world, especially at this size, would be thrilled with a 7.7% operating profit. Obviously, they're looking for Tesla to be more in the 15, 16, 17% range. That will probably happen again, just not in, not in this period. So while overall, overall, he's showing that the company will be down quarter over quarter and year over year, not significantly. The total non-GAAP, he's coming in at 60 cents. Right now, the street is at 63 cents. But that's likely to come down this week as we get a bunch of people reviewing their numbers. 
before the big number comes in on April 2nd. And there could be additional revisions after that as we get closer to the earnings report. And as I mentioned, Troy Teslike is not a lot lower, he's a little bit lower on the units, but if you take his number, it would only change things about a penny, might be at 59 cents rather than 60. But remember, a lot of this also has to do with those that mar the margins, which is a big guess, could be right, could be wrong, but he's, it's a big guess. Hey, I'm thinking it could be higher than that, given the fact of the 2% per quarter estimate that we've heard from the likes of Jeff Lutz, and I think makes sense based on historically coming down about 2% per quarter. So maybe we can come in a little higher and that would jam the profits up quite nicely. All right, this is Randy Kirk. Please remember that I so appreciate just the fact that you watch me, okay? And thank you for being loyal and watching as much as you can. Um, also, it would be nice though if you hit the like button, that really helps. And then subscribe and notify. Um, tomorrow morning after the bell will be, of course, the funniest show on YouTube covering Tesla and Elon. That's when Brian and I get together and, you know, I do my best to set him up and then he takes wax at him. <laughs> and uh, later in the day, you'll have the sage of the Tesla community, <laughs> Larry Goldberg. And uh, I don't know if you know it, but Larry has owned substantial companies, started, founded substantial companies on four continents in Africa, South Africa, in London, in Israel, and the United States. Not bad for our Monday night guest, our Monday night and Friday night co-host. Anyway, my 100-employee manufacturing businesses would have been like a minor division of his biggest concerns. <laughs> so uh, if you get some value out of the conversations with Larry, with Brian, or with any of the rest of the crew, please consider helping support the channel. It would be amazing if you go down into the description and hit Patreon, hit the link, go over there. Three bucks a month? I mean, come on, you can do that. Five bucks, 10 bucks. Thank you so much for those who have joined this month. You are heroes in my book. All right, this is from Heinrich Zane. He says, Tesla semi-production, prototype plant, kicks into gear. So Heinrich is the guy that does the, uh, the um, uh, he, uh, follows the semi-truck story, okay? And I think he also does drones in that area. I'm a little bit confused by all these different guys now. But anyway, um, he says he's seeing partially assembled frames, axle housings, and leaf springs. He says, oh my. So he's been saying for a while now, it seems like they've probably got the truck now rejiggered uh, based on all the input they got from Pepsi. They probably know what they want to do with it going forward. Why wouldn't they start up production again and at least you know, make a hundred or two a month or whatever. So we'll see what happens on that. This is a, uh, something called Tom's Hardware. <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've ever quoted Tom's Hardware before, but anyway, Intel CEO Pat Gess Gelsinger has publicly invited Tesla CEO Elon Musk to tour the firm's semiconductor fab lines. In a post on the Twitter X social media platform, Gelsinger said he was thinking of Musk when he was awarded the $8.5 billion in CHIPS Act funding earlier this week. Gelsinger has also been courting Musk's arch foe, OpenAI Sam Altman. It is safe to say that the Intel CEO is trying to get an early start in filling the Intel Foundry Services order books. He's got this, you know, brand new facilities going up in three different states, I think. All right. All right. And you know what happens this week? We got a whole bunch of stuff happening this week, but you know what happens on Friday, right? Well, first of all, Friday is Good Friday. And so the stock market will be closed, but that doesn't stop the PCE. <laughs> the PCE will be published on Friday, even though the stock market is closed. So you get a three-day weekend to think about how the PCE came out. That's going to be interesting. Okay, so let's see here. We have got uh, Atlanta Fed Rafael Bostic speaking on Monday morning. We've got Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby speaking. He'll be at 9.05. Anyway, you got all that happening on Monday. And Lisa Cook will also be speaking on Monday. You know, I just tell you these things because those three talks could definitely affect the market. All right, then at 10 o'clock that morning, so Larry and I will be talking about it on Monday after more, late afternoon, uh, new home sales. Uh, last month, there were 661. They're expecting to come in at 675. Uh, that is probably uh, very likely that they would be up. Uh, on the new home sales front based on basically at this time, it's going to be all about inventory. 
people are buying homes. They're not the the mortgage rates are not stopping people from buying homes, and the people that are building new homes are getting deals anyway, whatever it takes to move the homes. You've heard me if you listen to the program all the time. We've talked all last week multiple times about the housing market. And right now, uh, it's strong. It's very, very strong right now. Uh, okay, then on uh, Tuesday, we have at 8.30, so these will all be reported on Tuesday morning, durable goods orders. Last month, they were down 6.2%. The, the folks that have been polled say that they expect it to pop back 1%. That's a big gain, 1% in a month. Don't know why they're thinking, why this particular category is moving up and down so much but we have seen strength in the in the inflation numbers on durable goods even at the same time every evidence is is that people are not buying durable goods so i'm not 100 sure then you got the durable goods minus transportation last month it was up 0.3 percent and this month nobody is guessing last month we have the s p case chiller home price index last month it was up 6.1 percent that is an annual rate not a month over month um, and this month, nobody's guessing again. So uh, I'm going to guess that that number is probably pretty close to where we're going to be sitting. Uh, that afternoon, Consumer Confidence Report comes out. Last month, it was 106.7, which is pretty strong. And this month, they're saying that might drop to 106.5. That would still be very strong. But we'll be looking on that one, as we always do, more at the details. Wednesday, all you've got is Christopher Waller, Fed Governor, speaking. That's all you got for that day. Then on Friday... That was on Wednesday. That's Thursday. Yes. Okay. So on Friday, initial job on Friday. No, Thursday. I'm sorry. Thursday, you've got initial jobless claims coming up. As I've mentioned for at least four weeks in a row, uh, the folks that are polled on this are guessing. They're going like this. I don't know. Let's see. How about 214,000? Last week it was 210,000. They're projecting 214,000. Who knows? It could be 197, it could be 230. Uh, as this, I, I don't know where they're getting, I don't know where these individuals who are guessing on that one get their information, but they've been completely wrong for months and months. So I don't see that that's going to be anything that we can guess at before that date. Okay, then we got the GDP revision. This is the second revision. It was at 3.2 uh, for the uh, fourth quarter. And now it's saying that it will stay at 3.2 after this revision. Chicago business barometer comes in. That uh, was 44 last month, and they're saying it'll pop up a little bit to 45. That would be more good news to the economy. I might have to start shrinking back to 50-50 again on my projection, but right now I'm still 65-35 recession. Pending home sales were down 4.9% last month. That was a bit of a surprise, uh, but it also could have been weather-related, many people have said. So for February, they're saying it will be up 1%. We'll see what happens on that one. Kind of a bounce back, better, nicer weather. Consumer, another consumer sentiment survey. We got two different consumer, oh, consumer con confidence. This is the different one. This is the consumer sentiment survey. And it was at 70. This is a revision again, the final revision. It was at 76.5. The economists who were asked, they believe it'll be the same. No change there. All right. Then we got Friday. Good Friday. And of course, the name of the the name of the program is Good News Friday, and this particular this particular week, Good News Friday will have double meanings, and the meaning will be a very strong one. Okay, we have. Well, let me just talk about this for a second before we start talking about it. Um, uh, let's. This is an article from Yahoo. During his press conference on Wednesday, Jerome Powell noted Wednesday that the Fed's estimates have this number, meaning the PCE number, coming in below consensus. Following his comments, Neil Dutta at Renaissance Macro reminded folks on X that inputs from the Consumer Price Index, the CPI, and the Producer Price Index, the PPI, with, with those reports get you nearly all the way there on estimating PCE inflation. Both indexes we note we noted were surprising to the upside. So as I've said many times before, you can take those two reports and you can do a little uh, number crunching and you can get most of the way there to the PCE. So he said, our mapping of the CPI and PPI data point to a smaller 0.3% rise in the core PCE indicator uh, last month, or deflator as it's called. Um, 
And uh, in a note on Friday, that isn't low enough to give Fed officials more confidence that inflation's on track to hit 2%, but it does at least underline the strength in January it was mostly a one-off. And then inflation today was at 2.3%. So let's take a look at what the economists are saying in advance of this. On uh, There's also the advanced uh, trade balance coming in that morning, the advanced retail inventories, the advanced wholesale inventories, and on all three of those, pollsters who asked economists for their opinion apparently came up with zeros. <laughs> per personal income, expecting that to go last month 1%, expecting it to go up another 0.4% on the personal income side. And that's nominal, not seasonally adjusted, not adjusted for inflation, a purely nominal number. That would still be a 5% per year. Um, you know, that would be strong, a little too strong, I think, for the Fed. Personal spending last month was up 0.2%. They're expecting it to be up 0.5%. That would be 6% per year. That's... <laughs> All those things would point to really good news for the economy, really bad news for the Fed. The PCE basic index, the headline number expected to come in uh, at 0.4% compared to last month, 0.3%. But then the core, last month was 0.4%. They're expecting that to come in at 0.3%. Again, all of these numbers would really be too high for the Fed. Um, I'm sure they would like it, both of those numbers to be under 0.3%, even if it was only 2.9, 2.8, 2.7%. Then we've got the core, um, I'm sorry, then the uh, year over year, last month was 2.4 on the headline. They're expecting that to pop up a bit to 2.5. And last month, the core the core PCE year over year was a 2.8, and they're expecting that to stay even. So those are what are coming up this week. None of those would be, that was not, you know, if, that, if that's how it comes in, it isn't earth-shakingly bad for the Fed but it also doesn't give them any additional confidence if this is what it turns out to be. All right, reminding you again, short trading week, no trading on Friday. This comes in from X News. This is kind of not, this is a slightly political, but it's X and it's Elon, okay? I cover everything that's Elon, everything that's Tesla, everything that's stock market, everything that's economy, okay. X is proud to defend Dr. Kulvinder Power, Power Gill. She has to spell her name every time that she that anybody asks her for it. They're going to defend her against the government-supported efforts to cancel her speech. She is a practicing physician in Canada specializing in immunology and pediatrics. Because she spoke out publicly on Twitter, now X, in opposition to the Canadian and Ontario government's COVID lockdown efforts and the vaccination mandates, she was harassed by the legacy media, censored by prior Twitter management, and subjected to investigations and disciplinary proceedings by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario that resulted in cautions being placed in her permanent public record. The legal battles that ensued has cost Dr. Gill her life savings, and she now owes 300000 in a court judgment due Monday. When Elon Musk learned earlier this week about her crowdfunding campaign to pay the judgment, he pledged to help Dr. Uh, uh, help. Dot, I'm sorry, help. X will now fund the rest of Dr. Gill's campaign so she can pay her 300000 judgment and her legal bills. Free speech is the bedrock of democracy and an critical defense against totalitarianism in all forms. And boy, the Canadian government is down the road a bit from the U.S. government in terms of being a totalitarian facility. I mean, it makes you see how a country that is based on the same basic principles as we are can just really, really get close to the fire when it comes to allowing the government to take all these horrific actions. So it can happen here, too. If it can happen in Canada, it can happen. It can happen here. So let's take a look at where the markets are now. We have got. Uh, well, we're not going to have anything on Tesla, so why am I going there? Let's go on over to the bonds, and what we have on the bonds in this exact moment is the ten-year is down point. I'm sorry, two basis points. That's good. Has dropped under four point two, as I predicted. We'll see if that continues. I said last week that it looked like the directionality, we would be under 4.2. We have got the two-year now at uh, uh, at a down uh, nine-tenths of a basis point. 
but it is now at 4.591, so very, very close to up uh, uh, four basis points of division. Now, I did read a report the other day I should talk to you about, and that is one uh, person, one bond expert said we would expect if the closing of the inversion is to happen, it's going to happen at both ends. So you're going to have the 10-year moving up as the two-year or two-month move down. Interesting. I had never thought of it quite that way. I'd be shocked to see the 10-year move up, but we'll see what happens. Uh, although it could move up if inflation moves up, obviously, or if the Fed acts to increase rates. The two-month is unchanged at this point and is still sitting at about 140 basis points above the uh, 10 year. All right, let's go into the oil. The oil is up slightly, 23 cents, sitting at $80.86. And Brent is almost $5 higher. So right now, this oil price is probably a little bit more based on what's happening in Russia. And in, of course, Russia, additional problems this weekend, as you well know. Um, and then, uh, uh, but at both of them higher uh, as we go into uh, starting next month, we're going to be uh, very, very close to the driving season where we have changes in the in the uh, types of products that are being used, which drives up price, as well as just the normal additional use case. Natural gas up a uh, very, very small amount, 0.24% here in the pre-market. We've got the dollar strengthening, continue to strengthen. Um, we've got gold up uh, 21.68, but still way down from the 22.20 range that it was uh, last week. So it's dropped a lot, but now it's heading back up a little bit. Copper is almost below that $4. So there you go, down 0.14% in the pre-market, sitting at 4.002. So I could see it going under four, but according to Larry, <laughs> and according to lots of people, not just Larry, Copper going negative would be an indication of a coming recession. Then you got Bitcoin up 2,164, but still sitting at 67,198, well below the 72, 72 5 area that it was at the top last week. Okay, equities. The Dow is up okay, 0.09% or 34. The S&P future and the NASDAQ future both down, but so little that it isn't worth talking about. You could put both of those in the unch category. For those of you new to the channel, unch is unchanged. All right. So that's what we've got for you tonight. I don't think there was anything else for me to read. Oh yeah. Listen, early, oh, there was a, important. This is really important. Early, earlier today, I did an analysis of Kathy Wood's latest newsletter. She's famously predicted that robo taxis will create $30 trillion in market capitalization, not just for Tesla, for everybody. She has yet to do a model on humanoids, but she also has expectations regarding electric vehicles, energy storage, and more. It's all covered in this newsletter. And it's, you could go get it yourself and you could spend probably an hour, an hour and a half analyzing all that. But in a half an hour, I not only give you what I think you care about, but I also give you my analysis on top of it. So you can go check that out and that would be right here. And uh, and by the way, it's already had a huge response. So you've probably already seen it, but if you haven't, that's why you need the card. Okay, that's all I got. It's been great talking to you.